So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks uh, Data Science Salon for having me on. Um, this is not going to be a technical talk. A rush for the exits ensues. This is uh, going to be, as Hung Fei Li, who I spoke to before, said, a talk uh, based in reality, which I thought was interesting because that's that was a perfect way to put it, which I, I hadn't actually thought of. So despite the bait clicky title, this is actually an optimistic talk. Um, this is what happens. It's a story about what happens when you build something you think is cool, cutting edge, something that can scale, something that can help make better dis decisions, more precise decisions. Um, you build it, and then for the most part, nobody comes. So how do you change that? As a uh, head of a data science machine learning group, uh, I've learned over time that once you build a product, that's sort of the end of one stage, uh, after which another stage begins where you have to sell and sell the product. And I'm talking in this case internally. So as way of background, I was a trader and portfolio manager for over 20 years on Wall Street and at banks and hedge funds. I traded discretionary and, and uh, for like five or seven years I traded quant towards the end. And so, let's start here. So this is funny because what I talk about, the, the thing we built in light of like chatbot that's going crazy right now within the last couple of weeks, it's just remarkable how um, the rate of change in AI right now is just incredible. Um, so for the past six years, I've worked at a reinsurance company, and uh, for those of you who don't know, reinsurance companies sell reinsurance to insurance companies to help them diversify their balance sheets. And I run the data science machine learning uh, team within our reinsurance company. It's called Transatlantic Reinsurance, and we just got bought by uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Our parent company, Allegheny, did. And we were tasked uh, by the CEO with something he was calling a moonshot project, was to, to design, develop an algorithmic trading model, uh, machine learning driven, for one of the underwriting lines of business. And we could we basically take that soup to nuts? So think, you know, underwriters are the traders of insurance and reinsurance. This is a finance comp, uh, finance, uh, uh, talk. So for those of you who know, they sell puts all the time. That has a bad asymmetric return. It's like drip, 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 premium, and then a blow up. So it's a very difficult style of trading. And our underwriters are some of the best in the world at the company. So anyway, we were tasked with building this thing. We built out um, an ensemble of, of multiple machine learning models that were tasked with making predictions on all sorts of different things. We tested it out of sample for about 18 months. The returns and the prediction metrics were extremely good for, for certain types of things we needed it to predict on. It was getting like a 70% success rate. And for our context, that was very good for what we needed to do. So um, I go to sell it to the underwriters, right? And I'm expecting money, fame, success, my team getting poached by a big quant hedge fund. Um, Stevie Cohen really does have a stuffed uh, shark in his foyer. Um, but for the most part, what I got was some crickets chirping and some tumbleweeds rolling in the background. And why was this, like I said, um, for me, having come from a background where I had built the products for myself initially for so many years, like I said, almost two decades, where they were directly correlated, there was a remarkable clarity between building projects for yourself and then seeing as a portfolio manager, do I get a bigger bonus? Am I going to get fired? It's like a direct line between building the product and monetizing the data. And so... Now having the team and having it be one step removed where we build it out for the traders essentially who are the underwriters, it was 
a little bit of an existential crisis. What does success look like when you're building out tools internally for other people? Is it a couple super users? Is it multiple people adopting it? Is it um, uh, the whole company adopting it? Is it high visibility? So through this slight existential crisis I was having, I began to develop sort of like a rule of thumb heuristic algorithm of steps that my team and I would take to try to sell the product and get the product adopted, make it stickier. And so, as you all know, this is the, the idea of product adoption and who adopts it and when is, is not a new thing. And uh, this chart, I think, is from the 50s. And, and when we talk about you know innovation in this context is just really, innovation means anything different than it's been done in the past. So we should think that people won't adopt it all at once, and this is sort of the, the curve that represents that. Um, so my brother-in-law is named Miguel uh, Avila, and he flew helicopters for Marines for 20 years, and including uh, Marine One for George Bush uh, Jr., which is the presidential uh, helicopter. And they had a saying, if they were flying and multiple things went wrong at once, you need to worry about the alligator closest to the boat, right? What's going to take you out of the boat and eat you? So the, <clears throat> the thing that I then thought about is, again, how do you, what does it mean to be successful when you're building products for other people? And so... For me, that alligator closest to the boat was once the product was put out, it needed to have extremely high visibility. And for, excuse me, let me just take a drink. So it's funny, all, all these things I'm going to show today, like I said, they're almost, they seem obvious. But when you tack them together, if you all have read Nassim Taleb's Anti-Fragile, the book is basically about creating your life as a call option, right? You cap your downside, you have unlimited upside. And I was telling, this one of my favorite books, so I was telling one of my friends that. I was like, wow, isn't that so uh, insightful? He's like, well, that's, I, why wouldn't you want to do that? But it's only until you see these things sort of in front of you, collectively in the aggregate, I think it, it, it makes more sense. I also like this, if you guys notice that, proverb from the United States. So that's, um, so you need to email everyone. Every additional eyeball is important. You need to go out of your comfort zone. You need to gamify it. You need to be talking to people at a cadence, probably uh, double the time that you're used to. You need to be talking to groups that are adjacent to the project, orthogonal to the project, if you think at some point in the future it could be helpful to them. <clears throat> so I, I ran the phrase management buy-in through Dolly 2, if any of you guys have ever played with that. And this is like nightmare fuel. Because like what, what in the training set says that this is management, right? So talk about, so bias in machine learning, the, the subtitle of my talk. So in terms of... Uh, Carrots and sticks, there's no greater stick probably than your boss telling you to do it. Maybe your boss's boss telling you to do it. So I understand that within the context of your company, this might not be possible. We were lucky enough that my CEO was very vocal about encouraging this project, calling it a moonshot, really looking towards the future of our company. And that creates stickiness. But it creates stickiness, I believe, only initially. So like once the CEO leaves, people sort of become a little more disinterested over time because he's not there to keep on repeating that. So one thing we began and put in, in almost all of our products is something called the IKEA effect. So if you've ever gone to Ikea, gotten one of those famous flat boxes, brought it home, and you have 150 pieces of dowels and screws and particle board, that's uh, the box from Ikea. And four or five hours later, that's your wardrobe. And you did it yourself. 
And this is actually, a lot of these things, there's five or six of these types of things that are sort of couched and anchored in behavioral sciences, behavioral economics, and this is a cognitive bias that is called the IKEA effect. And it actually means that if you, you will overvalue or not value, you put a disproportionate amount of value on something you help build yourself. And so when we build out our apps, and in this big, like I said, ensemble machine learning thing we had, we're very cognizant of building out a piece of it or, or having the users, in this case the underwriters, they have to sort of get their hands dirty and they help uh, by putting in inputs and then the inputs begin to form sort of a spin-off data set that's also could be considered like an alpha in trading, in trading terms. And as they see, they actually see this data set growing and I think, um, I hope to think that it has some uh, IKEA effect for them and it helps to re increase the stickiness of the product and the adoption. So I think this is a slide. I, I, don't, I don't like to do slides that have a lot of words in them because I don't want you guys to read. I have to be forced to read, but in this case I think it's interesting. So again, this is sort of an should be an obvious one, right? You want to you don't want to make a you don't want to be an incrementalist, right? You want to make a fantastic product that leapfrogs over all the other products. And the classic example of that is the iPhone with Steve Jobs, and this is what he said. I think it was in 2007 when he first um, showed it to people, and he calls it a leapfrog, right? So that means that once you're using this new product it should be completely obvious to the users that they would never go back to the old way that it was. It should be that good, and that's sort of the, you know, there's a, well, this is a chief justice. There was a chief justice that said, they used to think about what the definition of obscenity was. He said, well, I know it when I see it. It was, this guy's name was Potter. And that's the same type of thing. You sort of intuitively understand when something is so much better than the previous version of it. and and. Obviously, this is context specific because sometimes you might be tasked with something that's actually just a, and it has to be an incremental improvement. But if you have that ideal of making it so much better, and sometimes the, the customers or the internal people don't know necessarily what they want, and that goes to the Henry Ford quote, right? It's like you have to sort of step outside of the box of what you think is possible because you keep on asking the same questions and thinking about the same context, you'll get the same answers, right? Faster horses. So, Something that my group always shoots for at the beginning of a project is how high can this project go? What's the ideal version look like? Is this a leapfrog? And then even if we don't attain that leapfrog, many times we go much higher than we thought we would have initially. So everybody's giving thumbs up in this picture. So if you've ever gotten your car worked on or you've had a plumber come over, had your roof done. That was a stock image for a uh, home mortgage. The guy looks very nervous. If you ever had any of these things done, then you've been on sort of the potential disadvantage or losing sight of an asymmetric information relationship. And by that, what I mean is you're dealing with somebody that has many more times up at bat, more frequently, daily, than you do in months or years in the case of buying a home. So you have no understanding of what the whole picture looks like when it comes to things like pricing. So if I asked you, what's it cost to replace a shorted wire that talks to your thermostat? Is it $100? Is it $300? Is it $600? You don't know because you don't, you don't live in that world every day. And so <clears throat> in the same way, these Products can be built through data science and machine learning that basically aggregate all the disparate pieces so that the user has what becomes almost like a God view, like video game term, or like Uber used to call it God view, and they got in trouble for that. So when we build out our products, we're always looking for this. Again, this is analogous to an alpha in trading. It's how, what's your secret sauce to beating the market? And the secret sauce sometimes come from the collective of the mosaic versus your 
competitors who have only pieces of the mosaic. And last but not least, as we've seen with cryptocurrencies named after dogs, the fear of missing out is very strong. So to give what, what uh, Thaler, the behavioral economist, called a bit of a nudge, it's okay to nudge if you hear about a similar product being used at another company. It's okay to nudge and let them know that it's being used. It's okay to um, sort of stoke that fire a little bit. Um, it's great if competing products are being used successfully and they're being written about. It's even better if you can get management to send out an email when they find out about it. So that's been something that's been, uh, it's something that we, we want to retain the option to sort of harness when it comes up. Um, one of the things that we, we explicitly don't do is say that we use data science to provide insights. Because insights is sort of the, providing insights is sort of the insidious punchline of every data science project that you ever hear about. So what's an insight, right? Insight's an abstraction, and insight's an extra piece of work that the people have to do. So we don't provide insights. We basically, what people really want is they want projects um, done for them uh, in a better way, faster, more scalability, but without the, them having to worry about it as sort of impinging upon their job security. And that's sort of like the, the truth of that. So there's a balance. Those things seem to be op at opposition with one another, and they are, so you have to strike a balance uh, between that. And if you guys have noticed, a lot of these things are sort of couched in, in some of these authors. And so it's, these are some of the people I've thought about when we were making this heuristic algorithm up. And there is my uh, email. And that's the presentation. Do we have any questions?